think I should get started because we're gonna, we could probably spend the whole hour filling this thing out. Um, thanks for coming to see me, I'm Brandon Sanders. We, um, we keep forgetting to ask them to put me in the grand ballroom for this, so I apologize for those who have friends or who are outside the scene can't get in. We'll try to make sure next time. Uh, we're going to run this like I normally do. If you've never been to one of these before, it's half Q&A, half reading. So, I am going to read to you from Wax and Wayne 4. Um, but, since we're still filling in this up, what we'll probably do is we'll start with some Q&A. Uh, so, sorry dude, I told you I wasn't going to start with Q&A, but I think I will, because we're still filling in. So, we're going to take questions from this uh, microphone right here now. Make sure that they are spoiler-free questions. This is not a spoiler-rific Q&A. We will do one of those at the, the Dragon Steel Con. Um, but this, too many people will get spoiled on books. Um, and so, Please ask questions that are not going to reveal uh, plot points from future novels. Um, if you have questions, I will blab at you for a while. Once we're, we're filled in a bit, I will jump to a reading, and then maybe we'll have time for more Q&A, maybe not. Who knows? You never know what you're going to get. Brandon's like a box of chocolates. Okay. <laughs> so, um, I re remember our hearing that Harry Badoodle, when she hired you, or was in like hiring you for uh, the Wheel of Time, that she, one, loved your eulogy, and two, she read this book. My question is, as an editor, did she ever give you any uh, hints as to like, what she may have changed if she were editing this one for you? You know, she never did tell me what she would have done on this one, but she was one of the editors on Way of Kings. Um, and so I got to see, you know, what she would do to that. A lot of Harriet's revisions, this is Harriet, Robert Jordan's uh, widow, and also his editor. Um, she edited him first, then she married him. And she always jokes, it's like, this is, I, I did it to make sure my editorial advice couldn't get ignored. Um, <laughs> she's a fantastic editor. She edited a little book called Ender's Game also, um, that you might have heard of. So Ender's Game and the Wheel of Time and uh, The Way of Kings uh, are all on her resume. Um, and uh, she was really focused on specificity. This is one of her things. She didn't like vague language. She'd always be like, you say, you know, a thing. What do you mean by a thing? I'm like, well, reference is two senses back. She's like, no, no, say what it is. Don't say, don't, don't be vague. She'd always say, you'd be like, it's a wooden bed. What kind of one? You know, things like that. Um, and then her other main editorial thing was make sure to keep character voices. She'd be like, is the character's voice coming out in this paragraph? Is who they are affecting this? And things like that. And so, she's a very good editor. Those were kind of two of her focuses. Um, go ahead. Um, you said on an earlier panel that you rewrite the beginning of books after finishing them to make sure that you're making and completing on those promises. So my question is, how do you identify the promises that you've made after finishing a book? And how do you know that you've sown the correct seeds throughout the book? It's a good question. So, on the second part, how do I know I've sown the right seeds? This, I trust beta readers on. This is, um, I use beta readers extensively. And people imagine them as, of this, as this cabal of individuals that, that make me make all the changes that you hate. I, I see online, like, oh, the beta readers must have convinced you to do this. Well, that's not how it goes. Beta readers are a test audience, right? Um, they don't suggest any changes. I just watch to see, are the plots I'm trying to work out working, right? I have them at the end of each chapter talk about what's working and what isn't. And I can read from their responses what they got, what they understood, what they didn't understand, that sort of stuff. Um, how do I know how to start the book? Well, this is, unfortunately, like many things in writing, comes with practice. Um, so often, even though I work from an outline, and I, I really feel like I know what a book is before I start, it isn't until I finish it that I really understand where the book uh, was even going from the start. Um, and what I'm looking usually to do with that opening scene is I'm looking to evoke some of the same emotion that I'm gonna evoke in the story, right? If you think of some of the great openings of, say, movies or books, um, like the great opening to Indiana Jones, the first one, um, which is a little mini-adventure 
Um, it shows you and tells you everything that you need to know about Indiana Jones and the emotions you're going to have. You're going to see him as an underdog, even though he's this great adventurer. Um, you're, going to, you're going to see lots of action and adventure and him solving problems in clever and creative ways. It basically promises you what the rest of the movie is going to be. A lot of great openings do that somehow. They promise you what kind of story it's going to be. Um, and that doesn't mean you have to start with an action sequence. Um, but if this is a story that's going to involve a lot of loss and melancholy, then finding a scene that opens like that is very handy. If, um, you know, that's not even the only way. You could be like, this story is really about this character. I'm going to devise a scene that shows who they are and the sort of thing that they, that they stand for um, at the start of the story. Or you can show a thing that shows their character arc, shows their flaw, um, and kind of gets in your face with it. Um, like, that's the promise at the beginning of Name of the Wind, which uh, Patrick Brockwood added that frame story after the fact in order to get the promise, the proper promise, that this is a tragedy, right? You, when you open with the opening you do in that book, you realize what type of story is being told. Hi, Shalon. Thank you. Um, would Kelsey have ever considered remarrying for any has Kelsier considered remarrying for any reason? Um, he has not so, he never did it in the, yeah, let's say no. <laughs> no, uh, no, no thoughts of remarrying. What question about the Cosmere does Chris most want answered? What question about the Cosmere does Chris most want answered? She would want to know what happens in the beyond. Mm. <laughs> Follow secondly by how can you get Stormlight off of Roshar? Era <laughs> uh, 2, uh, yep. question. Sorry, I'm a little nervous, but uh, then, I thought that until I finished reading Fans of Morning, I thought that, you know, Arnie's going to be good, Arnie's going to be great. He's not perfect, but everybody would be on his side. It turns out there's trillions against him. Uh, you know what? Don't don't stress it. Ask it to me another time in private, and I will try to answer you. So it's a, that's a very difficult question to circumlocute uh, without giving spoilers. You, good job. Don't don't stress. <laughs> okay. Can you lean in a little bit more so they can hear? Uh, so a long while back, you mentioned that if certain circumstances hadn't happened, you would tell them. The people on Taldane probably would have been the first to space. Yes. It interests me greatly because they didn't really have a magic system that is very conducive to fast travel. I didn't say, did I say to FTL? You did it, that's true. Yes. <laughs> so my question is, is there a method other than like augmented rights and like search by rights uh, for, uh, for fast and light that could be achieved by any minor shark as long as they have access to so the question is, if, yes, there is, but it depends on if you get the Shades Mark, because shade, you can travel FTL in the physical realm through Shades Mark. Basically, stick a spaceship in Shades Mark and travel between shark pools, and you've achieved FTL, right? Um, because travel through Shades Mark, you can walk between planets in Shades Mark. Um, and so anyone who can get in and out of Shades Mark reliably um, can FTL. Um, Spaceships and Shades Mark. Now, ways in and out of Shades Mark are very rare, which is extremely limiting, but it is possible. Uh, yeah. Big, big pivot. Um, I have a Magic the Gallery question for you. Um, <laughs> Ooh, okay. Um, it actually has to do with. Um, so, I think blue. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, so. If you were to give advice to somebody who was starting to build their own commander cube, what sort of thing would you, what sort of advice would you give them? Um, so I would give the advice for commander cube um, that create your own cards like the weird things I did in order to facilitate it because it makes drafting so much funner. Like if you want to actually have a cube, you have to make the drafting card fun, right? That's the reason to add it as a cube rather than just like regular commander. Um, and if you add those things in, 
then you are you can do sealed commander, right? You can do drafted commander, but you need some sort of facilitators. Wizard Coast came up with their own; those theirs work fine. But I think part of the fun of designing cube is designing some of your own mechanics, and I would recommend doing that. So it's going to depend on their perceptions of themselves and their friends' perceptions of them. But yes, it can change over time. Hi, actually, I don't know how many people in here. No, it's probably a lot. But um, I'm asking about uh, Ali Transgos, the evil, evil librarian. Excellent. I just started reading it, and I just was asking to ask about like the writing style of it is like really fun. Like I know it's not a lot of that's okay. But, um, like, how did you come up with the right stuff? Excellent question. I find it fun that it's like, it doesn't have to be super serious. It's very opposite of super serious, yeah. Uh, except the ending of the fifth book, though the sixth book is coming out soon, so. Uh, I turned in the sixth book, and it's in the editor's hands. They promised they were going to try to have it out this year. They didn't do that. But we're really pushing them to have that next year. Um, so, and this one, this is the actual ending. It's from me. You can trust me. Don't trust Alcatraz. Um, <laughs> the, the sixth book is going to be called um, Bastille vs. the Evil Librarians. Um, but uh, the subtitle is Alcatraz vs. his own dumb self. Um, and, um, yeah. But regardless, how I came up with that writing style. So, that writing style is very different from my other writing styles. Um, and I devised it at, because I needed a break from writing Mistborn. Um, so Alcatraz came around because Mistborn 2 was the first sequel I ever had to write. Right? Before that, I had tried to break into the business by writing a whole bunch of standalones or first novels, and I finally broke in. And Mistborn was the first trilogy that I pitched to an editor as an action series, and I wrote the first one, and I found that I really enjoyed it, but I was used to jumping projects, and so I immediately wrote the second one. And it's that I've been, been so long on schedule that I'm like, I need a break. And I kind of joke that I just climbed under my table. My girlfriend at the time went out of town with her family for like a family thing, so I was just like, I'm, I'm dead to the world. I crawl under a table and I wrote Alcatraz as a break from um, between Mistborn 2 and 3. Um, and it was a really nice break. Uh, it's what I needed to refresh myself. And so my goal was to make it the most different I could imagine from my main writing style. Um, which is kind of jarring to some people who pick it up, uh, who have read a lot of my other books, and then they get that. Um, but uh, it was meant to be a break. And I, I, I discovered wrote those books where I outlined my other books. Kind of, I did that to practice what we call discovered writing, which is just trying to on the fly. I would often brainstorm, it's like, a, like an improv game, I brainstorm a bunch of stuff that have to be in the book, and then I would try to write the book incorporating those. I'm like, I have to put talking dinosaurs in. I don't know why, but I'll find a place for them. <laughs> so that's where those books came from. Um, we are going to, let's take, let's take three more questions, and then I'm going to do the reading, and then we'll take more questions. So that way the people who are in line can sit down except for the next three. That way you won't get like right up to it and be disappointed. Um, so uh, three more questions and then we'll do the reading. And then there might be time after. All right, thank you. I'm also a big fan of Alcatraz. Like, I haven't read any of other series. I feel like it would be jarring if I switched. If you said it's very different. But um, by the way, they're so early and you still don't know anyone from a chicken. Um, Anyway, I was going to ask, like, from Alcatraz, um, which characters do you like, but in, like, in what book do you like the books? In what book do I like the characters the most? So, um, specifically tied to Alcatraz. Um, it's interesting because um, Grandpa Spencer is actually based on my mom. Um, <laughs> it's habitually late to everything. If you guys haven't read the, the books, Grandpa Spencer's uh, superpower is he can be late to things. He's really 
really good at it, so he'll be linked to things like bullets shot at him and, you know, tax day, so he kind of pays tax and stuff like that. Um, and it's based on the fact that uh, my mom, I love her, but she can never be on time to anything. And if she had to pick you up from school, because, you know, you, you didn't miss the carpool or the bus or something, you'd be there for two hours. Um, but my real answer to this question is I usually pick whatever book I'm writing right now to be my favorite. I can't afford it to be any other, right? I have to have my favorite be whatever I'm working on. Um, and that's just a mindset that's very handy for a writer to be, because, particularly one like me, where I'm always like excited by the next thing. And part of what made the difference between all those years I spent unpublished and, and then got published was focusing on the books that I wanted to release rather than on the next book, which could be perfect in my head and never was when I wrote it. I had to fix it, so. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So, what is your favorite card to put in the 99 on the commander deck? Uh, my favorite card to put in the 99 of a commander deck. So my favorite card of all time is the Susan Doppelganger, which is definitely not the best clone ever printed. It's been replaced time and time again by better ones, but it was one of the first cards I connected to when I got into Magic in 94. Um, and I, any blue deck I would find an excuse for the Susan Doppelganger, even if it's not the best choice, um, it will go in. Um, so, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go with the Zoom Doppelganger. I just love that quick mover art. It's just, it's gorgeous, and it's a cool, tricksy card, so. Um, so, can leechers leech off of other types of investiture across the Cosmere, and how do people power their powers on other Right, so Skadrians can use metal from other worlds. The metal is considered a facilitator, a key to reach into the spiritual realm, which uh, distance doesn't matter for the spiritual realm. Um, so, leechers, all of the elementic powers, um, leechers in particular, you, they do have an influence with the other, the other uh, magic systems. Even if it's simple as um, a, um, a sharp blade would be very difficult, near impossible to push or pull against, because of the level of investiture it has, right? Um, and, uh, you know, copper clouds have some interesting ramifications, as well as seekers have interesting ramifications, and indeed leechers would work on other magic systems as well. Um, it's, it, it is a little tricky how it interfaces sometimes, but uh, it will generally do what you're expecting it to do. All right, so, time for a reading. Um, How many in here watched um, the prologue of Wax and Wayne on my... Okay, so um, so I think I might just do a reading of that because we only have a handful of you that have done that. Um, it's, uh, it's a nice reading to do because it is um, it is not spoiler because it takes place years before the series begins. And I really like to do readings of things that aren't spoilers. Um, I would have read to you from Sunreach, which is the new Skyward novella, but it is a spoiler for previous Skyward books. Um, if you're not familiar with that, um, let, me, let me tell you just a little bit about what's going on with Skyward. So, um, Skyward, um, I plotted, uh, it's kind of a new method I've been using. I used it for the Wax and Night books, I used it for Skyward. I wrote one book kind of as a proof of concept to myself, and then I plotted a trilogy to go with it. That's why Wax and Wayne and Skyward are four books long. Um, it feels like it, it's a really nice format for me. Um, and so I plotted Skyward to not give too many um, spoilers. Skyward 1 and 2 were team adventures, Skyward 3 was a solo adventure, and then Skyward 4 was a team adventure. Well, it turns out when I was writing Skyward 2, it did not work as a, as a team adventure. Um, I needed to uh, isolate the main character from her support structure in a way that didn't let me send people along. But that meant I had two solo adventures, and the first book is a team adventure with a large cast uh, of interesting characters. And that meant two books without seeing what was going on with them at all. Um, which my beta readers kept saying, man, I missed the rest of the team, I missed the rest of the team. And this is where you can thank the beta readers, because I'm like, man, I really should do some stories with the rest of the team to show what's going on behind, you know, um, with, with them. And so, 
um, with my, um, my good friend Jason Patterson, we have written a trilogy of novellas from different viewpoints among members of the team from the first book that are taking place concurrent with the third book. And the first of those is releases in like a week and a half or something like that. Um, and there'll be ebook, audio books, and then there'll be a print collection later on if you like, if you prefer print. And so um, I hope if you guys are following the Skyward series, you'll pick those up because we really integrated those a lot into what's going on in the books. Um, and they are mainline continuity. They're just what's happening with everyone else while Spence is off doing Spence's stuff, which she tends to do. Um, but if I read from those, it'd be, it'd be too much of a spoiler. So I'm just going to give you this little. Uh, this little advertisement for them, um, and instead we're going to read the prologue to Wax and Wayne 4, which is from Wayne's viewpoint when he's a little boy. <laughs> Wayne knew what beds were. A few other kids in the settlement had them. Sounded much better than a mat on the ground, especially a mat he had to share with his mom when the night when the nights were cold, because they didn't have any coal. Plus, there were monsters under beds. Yeah, he heard stories from the other kids in the settlement about misraids. They hid under your bed and stole the faces of people you knew. So bed sounded real nice, soft and squishy on top. It was someone underneath that you could talk to. It sounded like the rust in heaven. <laughs> Other kids were scared of those things, but Wayne figured those kids just didn't know how to properly negotiate. He could make friends with something what lived under a bed, he just had to give it something he wanted, like someone else to eat. Maybe he could ask his mom for a little brother. Anyway, no beds for him, and no proper chairs. They had a table built by Uncle Gregor. Back before he got crushed by a billion rocks in a landslide and mushed up into a bloody bowl that couldn't hit people no more. Wayne kicked that table sometimes, just in case Greg's spirit was watching somewhere, and he was maybe fond of the table. Russ knew there was nothing else in this little one-room, one-window home Uncle Gregory cared about. Best Wayne had was a stool, so he sat on that and played with his cards dealing hands and trying to hide cards in his sleeve as he waited. This was a nervous time of day. Every evening, he thought maybe she wouldn't come home. Not because she didn't love him. Ma was averse to sweet spring flowers in the sewage pit of a world, and he'd punch anyone who said otherwise. No, he worried because one day, Pa hadn't come home. One day, Uncle Gregor, Wayne kicked the table, hadn't come home. So, don't think about that. Wayne thought, bungling his shovel and spilling cards over the table and floor. And don't look, not until you see the light. He couldn't help, help, or he could feel the mine out there. Nobody wanted to live next to it, of course. So Wayne and his mom did. Over next to the wall was the pile of laundry that Wayne had done for the day. His mom's old job that didn't pay well enough, so he, hid it, uh, so he did it while she pushed my cards. He didn't mind the work. Spent half the day trying on all the different clothes, from one sent by Gramps to the one sent by young women, and pretending to be them. His mom had caught him a few times and seemed angry, demanding why he did it. That exasperation still baffled him. Why wouldn't you want to try them all on? That's what clothes were for. It wasn't nothing weird. He just liked it. And what harm did it do? None to nobody. Sometimes, besides, sometimes folks left stuff in their pockets like decks of cards. <laughs> he fumbled the shuffle again, and as he gathered the cards up, he did not look out the window. Not until he spotted the light. He could feel the mind anyway, though, that gaping artery, like a hole in someone's neck, red from the inside, spurting out light like blood and fire. They had to go down to get the beast's insides, searching for metals, then escape its anger. And you could only get lucky so many times. Then he spotted it, light. With relief, with relief like fire on a frigid night, he glanced out the window and saw, saw someone walking along the path, holding up a lantern to illuminate her way. Wayne scrambled to hide the cards under his mat, then was certain to lay down with the lamp out, feigning sleep when the door opened. She'd have seen his light go out, of course, but she appreciated the effort he put into pretending. <laughs> she settled down on the stool, and Wayne cracked an eye. 
Small wore trousers and a buttoning shirt, her hair up, clothing and face smudged. She just sat staring at the light of the lantern, watching it flicker and dance, and her face seemed more hollow than it had the day before, like something, someone was taking a pickaxe to her cheeks. That mind's eating her away, he thought. Even if it hasn't gobbled her up like it did Pa, it's gnawing on her. Rats on a barn wall. Ma blinked, then fixated on something. A card he'd left on the table. Ah, hell. She picked it up and looked right at him. He didn't try to pretend he was asleep no more. She'd dumped water on him. She'd done it before. Wayne, she said, where did you get these cards? Don't remember. Wayne, found them, he said. She waved her hand toward him, and he reluctantly dug the rest out from under his nap and handed them over. She tucked the one he'd found into the box. He knew from experience she'd spent all day looking through the settlement for the one who'd lost them. But she didn't have time for things like that. He wouldn't have her losing more sleep on account of him. Tarm vesting down, Wayne mumbled. They was in a pocket of his overalls. Thank you, she said softly. Ma, I've got to learn cards, Wayne said. See, that way I can earn a good living, so I can take care of us. A good living, she said, with cards. Don't worry, he said quickly. I'll cheat. <laughs> Can't make a living if you don't win, see? She sighed, rubbing her temples. Wayne looked at the cards in their stack. Arm, he said. He's terrorists, like Paul was. Yes, she said. Terrorist people always do what they're told, he said. So what's wrong with me? Nothing's wrong with you, love, she said. You just haven't got a good parent who can help you. Mom, he said, scrambling off the mat. He took her arm. Don't talk like that, Mom. You're a great mom. She hugged him to her side, but he could feel tension in her. Ah, hell. What had they found? Wayne, she asked softly, did you take Demi's pocket knife? He talked, Wayne said. Rust that rustin' bastard. Wayne, don't swear like that. Rust that, he said in a rail worker's accent instead. The rustin' bastard. <laughs> he looked at her innocently and was rewarded with a smile she couldn't keep in. Silly voices, voices always made her grin. Pa had been good at them, but Wayne was better. Particularly now that Bob was dead and couldn't say them no more. <laughs> But then her smile faded. You can't take things what don't belong to you, Wayne. That's something thieves do. I don't want to be a thief, Wayne said softly, putting the pocket knife on the table beside the cards. I want to be a good boy. It just happens. She hugged him closer. You are a good boy. You've always been a good boy. When she said it, he believed it. Do you want a story, love? She asked. I'm too old for stories. He lied, desperately wishing she'd ignore the, the objection. I'm 11. One more year and I can drink at the tavern. <laughs> what? Who told you that? <laughs> Doug. Doug is nine. <laughs> Doug knows stuff. <laughs> Doug is nine. <laughs> so you're saying I'll have to snitch booze for him next year because he can't buy it himself yet? He met her eyes, then started snickering as she smiled. He helped her get dinner, cold oatmeal with some beans in it, but at least it wasn't only beans. Then he snuggled into his blankets on the mat, pretending he was a child again to listen. It was easy to feign that. He still had the clothes, after all. <laughs> this is the story, she said, a blatant barn of the unwashed bandit. Oh, Wayne said, a new one? His mother grinned, then leaned forward, waggling her spoon toward him as she spoke. He was the worst of them all, Wayne. Baddest, meanest, stinkiest bandit. He never bathed, you see. Because it takes too much work to get properly dirty? Wayne asked. No, because he... Wait, it's work to get dirty? You gotta roll around in it, you see, Wayne said. Why in Harmony's name would you do that? To think like the ground. <laughs> to... She smiled again. Oh, Wayne, you're so precious. Thanks, he said. Why ain't you told me of this blatant barn if he was so bad? Wouldn't he be the first one you told stories about? You was too, too young, she said, sitting back, and the story too frightening. Oh, this was going to be a good one. Wayne bounced up and down. Who got him? Was it the law man? It was Alabaster Jack. Him, Wayne said with a groan. What? 
Jack always brings them in, Wayne complained. He never shoots a single one. Not this time, Ma said, digging into her oatmeal. He was young this time, and he knew Blake and Barnes was the worst. Killer to the core. Even Barnes two sidekicks. Gut the Killer and No Ways Joe were ten times worse than any other bandit that ever walked the roughs. Ten times? Wayne said. Yup. That's a lot. Almost double. <laughs> His mom paused, then leaned forward and got back into it. They robbed the payroll. Taking not just the money from the fat man in Allendale, but the wages of regular folk. Bastards, Wayne said. Wayne, fine, fine, regular old turds then. <laughs> Again, she has thin it. Do you know what the word bastard means? <laughs> it's a really bad term. The kind you've got when you've really got to go when you hold it in too long. <laughs> and you know this because? Well, Doug told me. <laughs> of course he did. Well, Jack, he couldn't stand for stealing from the common folk of the roughs. Being abandoned is one thing, but everybody knows you take money what goes toward the city. Trick is, Blayton Barn, he knew the area real well, and so he rode off into the most difficult part of the roughs to reach, and he left one of his men to guard each of the spots along the way. So Jack, he was going to have to fight his way through all three. Why is it always three in stories, Mom? Wayne asked. Three bandits, three guns, three mines? Well, how high do you think bandits can count? <laughs> Probably not that high, Wayne agreed. Fortunately, Jack was the bravest of men, she said, and the strongest. If he was the bravest and strongest, Wayne said, why was he a lawman? He could just be a bandit, and nobody could stop him, right? Well, what's harder, love? Doing what's right or doing what's wrong? The right thing. So who gets stronger? The fellow that does the easy thing, or the fellow who does the hard thing? Huh. He nodded. Yeah. Yeah, you can see that. She leaned forward, grinning in the light. Jack's first test was the river Human, the vast waterway marking the border with what had been Kolos lands, but now controlled by bandits. The swift waters moved at the speed of a train. It was the fastest river in the whole world. It was full of rocks. Gud the Killer had set up there across the river and watched the lawman. He had such a good eye and a steady hand that he could shoot a fly off a man at 300 paces. Why'd you ever want to do that? Wayne asked. Better to shoot right in the fly, right? That's got to hurt something bad. <laughs> Not that kind of fly, love. <laughs> so, what did Jack do? Wayne asked. Did he stink up? Not very long and like to stink. I don't think they ever do that. I bet he didn't stink. Well, Ma said. Wayne clutched his blanket, waving. Jack was an even better shot, she whispered. When Gud the Killer sighted him, Jack shot him across the river even. Whoa, how'd Gud die? By bullet, love. <laughs> right through the eye, Wayne said. I suppose. And so Gud lined up a so so Gud lined up a shot, and Jack did likewise, but Jack shot first, hitting Gud straight through the sights into the right eye, right wrong? Um, and then his head exploded, Wayne said, like a fruit, the crunchy kind, all right, so its shell is tough, but it splits anyway. Is that how it happened, Mom? Mom? Yes, Mom said. <laughs> Dang, Mom, Wayne said, that's gruesome. <laughs> you sure you should be telling this story to me? <laughs> should I stop? Hell no, how did Jack get across the water? He flew. Ma said. She absently set her bowl aside. Oatmeal finished and made a flourish with both hands. He had powers, Jack did. Alamancy powers. He could fly and talk to birds and eat rocks. Wow, eat rocks? Yup. And so he flew right over the river. But the next challenge was even worse. The Canyon of Death. Oh, Wayne said. Bet that place was pretty. Why do you say that? Because nobody's ever going to visit a place called Canyon of Death unless it's pretty. <laughs> but somebody visited, right? We know the name. So it's pretty, right? <laughs> Beautiful, Ma said. The candy carved through the middle of a bunch of scattered, crumbling rock spires. The broken peaks lined, peaks lined with colors. But the place was as deadly as it was beautiful. Yeah, figures. Jack couldn't just fly over this one for the second of the bandits hid within the canyon. No ways, Joe. 
He was a master of pistols, and he could also fly and turn into a dragon and eat rocks. So if Dra Jack tried to sneak past, Joe would shoot him from behind. That's the smartest way to shoot someone, Wayne said, on account of them not being able to shoot back. True, Ma said. So Jack didn't let that happen. He had to go right into a canyon, but it was filled with snakes. Bloody hell! Wayne, regular old boring hell then. How many snakes? A million snakes. Bloody hell! But Jack, he was smart, Ma said, as well as being able to shoot and eat rocks too. So he thought to bring some snake food. A million bits of snake food? Not just one, but he got the snakes to fight over it, so they mostly killed each other. But the one that was left was the strongest, naturally. Naturally. So Jack talked it into biting no ways Joe. And so Joe turned purple, Wayne said, and bled out of his ears, and his bones melted, so the melty bone juice leaked out of his nose, and he collapsed into a puddle, puddle of deflated skin, all white, while hissing and blubbering, because his teeth was melted too. Exactly. <laughs> Dang, Ma, you tell the best stories? <laughs> it is better, she said softly, leaning down on the stool, their lantern burning low, because the ending has a surprise. What surprise? Well, once Jack was through the canyon, what now smelled like dead snakes and melted bones, he spotted the final challenge, the Lone Mesa, a giant plateau in the center of an otherwise flat plain. That's not much of a challenge, Wayne said. He could fly to the top. Well, he tried to, but the Mesa was blatant barn. What? That's right, Ma said. Barn joined up with the Colos, the ones that change into big monsters, not the normal ones, ones like old Mrs. Knock. And they showed him how to turn into a monster of humongous size. So when Jack tried to land on it, the Mesa done gobbled him up. Wayne gasped. And then, he said, it mashed him beneath its teeth, crushing his bones like... No, Ma said. It tried to swallow him. But Jack, he wasn't just a good shot, and he wasn't just smart. He was something else. What? He was a big damn pain in the ass. <laughs> Ma, that's swearing. <laughs> I mean it in a good way, though, love. Oh, well, that made it all right, then. <laughs> Jack, Ma said, was always going about doing good, helping folks, making life tough for the bad ones, poking his nose into things, asking questions. He knew exactly how to ruin a bandit's day, he did. So as he was swallowed, he stretched out his arms and legs and pushed, making himself a lump and blade of arms through, so that the monster wouldn't breathe. Monsters like that need lots of air, you know. And right then, Alan Answer done, Jack done choked the barn from the inside. Then, when the monster was dead on the ground, Jack sauntered out down its tongue like it was some fancy man, sat down outside the carriage for a rich man. Well, that was a good story, Ma. She smiled. It was so great to see that. Ma, he said, is the story about the mind? Well, she said, I suppose we've got to walk into the beast's mouse now and then, so maybe, I guess. You're like the law man, then. Anyone can be, she said, blowing out the lantern light. Even me? Especially you. She kissed him on the forehead. You are my love, Wayne. You are whatever you want. You're the wind, you're the stars, and you are all endless things. It was a poem she liked. And he liked it, too, because when she talked, he believed her. How could he not? Ma didn't swear and she didn't lie. So he snuggled into his blankets and let himself drift off. Because a lot of what was wrong in the a lot was wrong in the world, but a few things were right. As long as she was around, stories meant something. They was real. Until one day there was another collapse at the mine. And that night, his mom didn't come home. There you go. So there you go, Little Wayne. Um, that book will be out a year from this November. I'm just finishing up the second draft. I know, I'm sorry. Um, these things take time in the publishing industry. I'm only one person despite what it may seem sometimes. Um, but um, I'm going to turn that one in. We have Cyclonic this November, and then next November, Wax and Wayne. And then November after that would be Stormlight 5. So.
so um, my uh, store manager and um, uh, events coordinator, Kara, came up and wanted me to warn you all that we had to do a ticketing system this year for lines. Um, you have outgrown my ability to sign all your books. I feel really bad about this. Um, after leaving uh, after midnight, multiple days in a row at previous fan exes, um, my people staged an intervention and said we have to do line tickets. Um, and so I can't get everyone's books. In fact, I think the tickets have all been given out. Um, but if you are in costume, based on one of my books, um, I will find a way to uh, say hello to you if you didn't get a ticket. I appreciate that. Um, and um, there's a small chance right at the end, right before things close, that I will be able to run down and do no personalizations, just quick signatures, which I can do fairly quickly. Um, I can't promise, but if you really, really hope you need a signature, um, then you can try to come in like right 15 minutes before the hall closes. And like I said, I will stand up and just walk down a line with people's books open, and I will sing the sign as many as I can. Um, this is the best we can do. Um, for years I've resisted this, but my team is like, no, it, 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 will, it, it kills me for days afterwards um, staying up. There are signings I've left at 5 a.m. There are signings where I've been kicked out of the venue multiple times to sign in the street until 2 in the morning. Um, because the stores closed and finally said we're going to do all events ticketed and I have relented, they are correct. Um, so this means that even for the Psychonic release, we're doing a ticketed event. That one it's randomized though, so that everybody has a chance um, to be able to, to get the personalization. And all the books will come signed at the event. I'll sign them all ahead of time, it's just if you want a personalization. Um, so I apologize for all of that, but I really do appreciate you guys. Um, and uh, thank you so much for supporting me in this crazy thing that I do. They just gave me the, the five minute warning and we are now in one minute. So I'm gonna call it here and head down and start the signing. Thank you again very much.